Class 53 on Golden Doves, we're starting today a new, um, a new uh, section, section 2. The t- section is entitled Semiology and Metaphysics. Let me explain the title first. So, semiology um, is um, the study of signs, right? Um, now, uh, there's all types of uh, different types of systems where there are signs. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, when you have the musical notes that the musicians read, that's a, that's, that's a semiological system because it's a system based upon signs. Um, sign language that's used to communicate with people who can't hear. So that's another semiological system. Um, a language, obviously human speech, is a semiological system. So there's different uh, systems of signs. There's, um, Morse code. Morse code is another semiological system. So any system of signs. So semiolo- semiology is the scientific study of um, systems of signs. Um, in addition to semiology, you have uh, metaphysics. So metaphysics um, is a philosophical outlook on the world related to Aristotelian thinking, related to um, Platonic thinking, which assumes that there is a world out there that exists. And metaphysics is the study of existence or the study of beingness. So the famous sentence in uh, Shakespeare, to be or not to be, that is the question, right? So that that assumes a metaphysical world, and that is the question for metaphysics, is what is beingness about, right? So there's a palm tree right there, right? So you see it in the video. So what is the beingness of that palm tree? What is the existence of that palm tree about, right? Um, and um, the Greeks were very much into metaphysical uh, thinking because they believed that there is an objective world out there and our job is to understand the beingness or the existence of the objective world out there so that's what metaphysics is about so let me start by reading to you a quote from Isaac Cardozo and um, this quote by Isaac Cardozo will uh, set the tone for uh, much of the chapter Um, and it kind of gives you a flavor of what this uh, chapter is about. Isaac Cardozo himself, by the way, was um, Misera Anusim. He was from Conversos. Uh, I believe he was in, uh, in Portugal, maybe he was born in Portugal, but eventually he uh, went to Verona, Italy, and he was a philosopher, he was a scientist, um, and he wrote many works. Um, so um, he actually wrote a book on the utility of cold water, and the book was actually dedicated to King Philip uh, of Spain. Um, Nevertheless, very interesting philosophical, intellectual figure, and like all the, uh, many of the Hachamim Sefaradim, the Hachamim Sefaradim were very great intellectual figures respected by the um, Gentiles, as well because of their intelligence. So he says as follows, there isn't a bird in the air or a tree in the forest or a flower in the meadow or an animal in the mountain, a fish in the waters, an herb in the field that tacitly as a working clock is not indicating the hand that made them, and the wisdom that designed them. So you see, when you have a clock, automatically, you understand that there is a clock maker. Can you prove it? No, I can't prove it. Could be that the clock just came about somehow. There was a tornado, and the tornado entered a metal factory, and somehow all these little, very intricate pieces were put together. It's, it's possible. Many people uh, believe that to be the case. They're called scientists. Uh, 
uh, evolutionary biologists believe that, as ridiculous as it sounds, it's actually given the idea of being scientific. So when you call something scientific, oh, that, well, of course, I mean, it is so, right? Because scientific, right? Or the Rebbe said so, right? Or Al El Sheikh, right? So the scientist said so. So it's, it's, it's true, right? So is it possible that a tornado came and created this clock? Yeah, it's, it's possible. Um, you know, is it possible that a monkey will one day write the theory of evolution, you know, just put it by a typewriter? I, I guess it's possible. Um, no, no intelligent per person thinks like that, right? No intelligent person <laughs> would reach that conclusion, but scientists do. So the point of uh, Isaac Cardozo is that when you see these amazing machines out in the world, those machines, they point out to the existence of a God. It doesn't prove the existence of a God, but it points out to the existence of a God. And intelligent people, they think in terms of not definite proof. Do I know that Donald Trump really exists? I never really met him, but I've, I've seen a lot of pictures and videos and people get very excited when the name of Donald Trump is mentioned, the eye twitches and uh, oftentimes even nervous breakdowns. So I'm assuming he exists. Do I know for sure? Uh, no, it could be that it's all a conspiracy, I suppose, right? So there's very few things that we know for sure, right? Right. So the point is, that intelligent people, they know how to read signs, and when you read a sign, you reach a particular conclusion, and you make decisions in your life accordingly. So that's the point of Isaac Cardozo. Yitzhak Cardozo. Alav shalom. Let's continue. Nieto and the autonomy of nature. That's section one. David Nieto was one of the great, great, great Chachamim um, Sefaradim. My father uh, loved David Nieto. He used to read his books. He used to teach me his books. Um, David Nieto was um, the he was uh, the, the rabbi in the Spanish and Portuguese in London, um, and then eventually, um, I mean, I will actually just to put things in perspective, he was actually born in Italy in um, in Venice. He was a doctor, like many of the great hachamim, sefaradim. He was a hacham in Livorno, Italy, um, and eventually. He went to the Spanish and Portuguese in London. My father points out that, and in my father's opinion, David Nieto had a profound effect on Isaac Newton. Um, and my father points this out in his writings on Isaac Newton. Um, anyway, so uh, David Nieto also wrote a great book called, um, uh, you know, Mate Dan, the, the second Kuzari, and uh, a lot of great works. So Nieto discusses the idea of the autonomy of nature. Hmm. The autonomy of nature. What does that mean, the autonomy? So there's a natural system in the world. There are scientific rules in the world. And we see that nature, the world, works in accordance with these scientific rules. And these scientific rules appear to be quite autonomous. And they're, they don't need something to make them work. They just work, right? So that's the autonomy of nature. So, um, let's read. The rise of modern secularism is intimately connected with the perception of the universe as a self-contained, autonomous entity governed by the laws of nature. So, part of the secular movement that has uh, plagued society, the Western world in particular, for centuries now, um, and is now reaching a crescendo in terms of the madness that is manifesting itself in the man, in the Western world, particularly the United States of America, which has turned into a, um, I mean, for lack of a better word, I'm trying to be gentle here, but let's just call it a large, insane asylum. Um, so part of that is, is so the rise of secularism, which had led, which has led to this insane asylum called the United States of America. Um, the rise of secularism is related to the scientific understanding of the world because until you had a scientific understanding of the world you posited the existence of God and you said okay so God is running the world that's how the world runs so well but once you have a scientific understanding of the world you say well so why do you need God everything just works so you have this clock everything works perfectly 
the widgets are perfectly put together and the clock doesn't need you don't need to posit the existence of God to understand the workings of the clock, right? So the, the clock is an autonomous entity, right? The clock became the symbol of the universe moved by an inner mechanism. So they use the clock as a mashal for the universe. The same way the clock doesn't require the clock maker, because it works perfectly, right? The universe doesn't require God following well-defined and mathematically predictable notions. And the bo bottom line is that everything in the universe follows these perfect... Um, you can predict everything. There's a cause and effect. And you can predict if a stone, uh, apple falls off the tree and the wind is going at this speed in that direction, I can predict where the apple will fall, right? So you don't need God because everything works perfectly and there are scientific rules that govern everything. And I see everything follows these scientific rules. So where's God? According to this theory, of course. But while... Um, and now my father is quoting, but while they were gargantuan toys, such clocks were far more than toys. So uh, during the course of the Middle Ages, clocks became very popular, clocks were invented. I don't know when the first clock was invented, but this footnote is describing the, how the invention of the clock and the fact that clocks became very prevalent in society affected the way people would think. So um, just give me a moment to see if I can find this footnote. Uh, we're on page 18. So let me look for the footnotes on page 18. Right. Right. Lynn White, Medieval Technology and Social Change. Right. And then there's another book called Clocks and Culture. That's really interesting. So you see how the invent sometimes an invention of something changes the way people perceive the world. So here we're talking about these gargantuan toys called clocks. And they weren't just toys, they were symbols related to the inmost and most unverbalized tendencies of that age. The unverbalized tendency of that age is a motion away from a theological worldview and a motion towards a more scientific worldview. By 1319-20, a novel theory of impetus was emerging transitional between that of Aristotle and Newton's inertial motion. So there began to be a transition from Aristotle, which has a fixed view of the world. Everything is, there's a static world. Everything has a very defined place and order. And then there was a transition to a more dynamic concept, which is the Newtonian laws of physics and the idea of motion and how objects move and it's so it's not just that things are fixed in their place so there's like a circle and encrusted in the circle is the moon and the circle goes around in the middle of that circle of course is the earth and then the moon is fixed in its place but suddenly things objects move and there are rules and they're not encrusted in a particular place and there are rules that govern how objects move under the older concept Nothing moved unless it was constantly pushed by an outside force in Aristotle. You have to have a constant force moving something. So how is the moon moving? So the only way to posit the motion of the moon is that something must be moving the sphere in which the moon is encrusted. Those spheres, of course, were translucent. So you say, oh, that's God. So God is moving that sphere. But now, suddenly with Newton, we realize, no, once something is sent into motion, unless there is um, an opposing force that stops its motion, it could be the friction of the air, it could be the gravity of another object, right? It will continue moving. That's called inertia. So under the new physical theory, things keep moving by means of forces originally imprinted upon them by vis impressa, right? Right. Um, the, the new... Um, the new um, theory of um, the new theory of Isaac Newton, of course, the new theory of Isaac uh, Newton is that things keep moving. As I said, so if you have, if I throw an object um, and I throw it fast enough to escape the gravitational force of the Earth, it will continue moving in space at that speed unless something stops it. Vis impressa means um, I, 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 I believe it's Latin. I'm not sure though, 
but it means the immediate force or the original force, right? So there's a visim presa, there's an original force, and that original force was the force that threw this ball really fast and it went into outer space, or a rocket ship perhaps would be a better example, right? So the visim presa impels something and it keeps moving unless it stopped. Moreover, regularity, mathematically predictable relationships, facts quantitatively measurable, were looming larger in men's picture of the universe. So now you have, you can make mathematical predictions using Isaac, using Isaac Newton's um, uh, laws of physics, right? And they can predict exactly how things will move. So suddenly the universe becomes discernible and understandable, and you understand the inner mechanisms governing the universe, and you can make, make predictions. Obviously, according to this, there is no need for a god. And the great clock, partly because of its inexorability, was so placefully masked, its mechanism so humanized by its whimsicalities, furnished the picture. And throughout this, with Isaac Newton giving us the, um, these rules that predict the motions of objects in the world, we have the invention of the clock, or the clock becoming not invented, but rather becoming more prevalent in society, and people seeing clocks, so you have this image of a clock, you have the scientific laws of Newton, and you see the conjunction of these two things led towards a motion away from God, and uh, let's say a motion away from the theology and a motion towards the scientific understanding of an autonomous universe. It is in the works of the great ecclesiastic and mathematician Nicholas Orismus, who died in 1382 as Bishop of Laizou, I probably mispronounced that, the name of that city, that we first find the metaphor of the universe as a vast mechanical clock created and set running by God. So we already have this bishop um, who was uh, in the 14th century that discusses the idea of the universe as a giant clock and who put this clock into motion, which is a, as a, equally a valid question as, well, the clock functions autonomously, that's great. So you want to move away from God, but who put the clock into motion? Who created the clock in the first place? Well, the answer to that question would be God. So uh, the Bishop of Lyso, um points that out so that all the wheels move as harmoniously as possible because everything in the clock is perfectly designed and perfectly aligned. It was a notion with a future. Eventually the metaphor became a metaphysics. So here we see this, what this uh, author is pointing out is to the idea of the clock not just enabling people to see time but enabling people to have a new view of how the universe works. And that new view, as I said, created a motion away from theology. That's the end of the quote. Later, Robert Boyle conceived of God as a divine clockmaker creating a universe that once started continues on its own mechanical course. So Robert Boyle, a scientist from the 17th century, he also looked at, at, at God as a clockmaker. Now notice, he believes in God. He's just saying that once the clock is put into motion, you don't need God anymore. So while Robert Boyle is saying, okay, there was a God who created this clock, and that's certainly something that is comports with Jewish thinking, but on the other hand, since the clock works perfectly, why do you need God? Right? That's, you know, the upshot or the inference that one can draw from Robert Boyle, uh, Boyle's words. Similarly, one motion, one moment, please. Okay. All right. So, similarly, the um, Deus flourishing in England at the time believed nature to be a fully autonomous entity designed by God and governed by its own internal laws rather than by divine intervention. Uh, so, so deism, or, or people who follow deism or deists, 
um, it's a um, perspective on what is God about. So they believe, or deists believe, that um, there is a single God, right? But they believe that the existence of a single God is not a function of revelation, such as Han Sinai, right? But rather, they believe that you can infer the existence of God by looking at the universe and looking at the you know logical um, um, lesson by studying the universe and seeing the perfection in the universe shows that there must be a designer who designed the universe. But the deists, they rejected uh, the idea of nevoah, prophecy. They rejected the idea of miracles. And the deists are against um, uh, ritual uh, religion. So that's deists. And in England, deism was very popular, I believe, but I could be mistaken that perhaps Benjamin Franklin was a deist, but there were many deists in this uh, point in uh, history. In the days of Robert Boyle, who, who himself was 17th century, right? So again, similarly, the deists flourishing in England at the same time believed nature to be a fully autonomous entity designed by God and governed by its own internal laws rather than by divine intervention. You don't need divine intervention. There is no need for God in the universe. Once you have this perfect clock, why do, would you need a clockmaker? The conception, the conception of nature found its ultimate expression in the publication of Isaac Newton's Principia, according to which the universe is conceived of as a law-abiding and fully autonomous machine, rigidly, I'm sorry, rigidly, sorry about that, determined by precise mathematical formula. So that's a Principia Mathematica of Isaac Newton, one of the great books written in the Western world ever, um, certainly. It just, it gives you a map, a blueprint, to understand how the universe works. And you can predict basically the motion of almost anything. I'm not talking about subatomic particles. I'm aware more of quantum mechanics. And I'm not talking about the theory of relativity. Those are at the extreme. But the, the rules of the, the Principia Mathematica, I mean, it's beyond brilliant that he was able to decode the motion of objects as he did is simply incredible. Isaac Newton was certainly one of the greatest minds ever in the Western world. So it gives you these laws. And by using Isaac Newton's laws, you can basically predict the motion of anything, right? Just based on simple mathematical, or actually precise math mathematical, not necessarily simple mathematical formula. Eventually, the theological and philosophical explanations associated with the design and function of nature appeared to be extraneous, obtrusive, and bizarre. So at first, they would say, well, there's a God to the world, and God created the world. But eventually people said, who cares? There is no God now in the world. We don't need God in the world. God plays no role in the world, according to these people. And therefore, what do I care about the origin of the world? Right? The result was a value-free perception of the universe. And not only that there is no God in the universe, you can look at the universe um, um, you know, in, a, in, in a new way. You, know, you don't have to look at the universe, for example, why does the sun rise this way to teach us the virtue of waking up early in the morning, right? right? That, because now that you said that there is no God in the universe, why would you, um, why would you um, necessarily need to re draw conclusions about things like this, right? So there's no values in the universe. There's no right and wrong in the universe, at least in that sense. Um, and we're going to study a little more about this, about Albert Einstein and quantum mechanics, but that will be in class, this is class 53, so that will be in class 54.